You know, one of the one of the great things about, you know, being a father, mother, leader, wherever you are in life, in your relationship to others, is when people see that we have an unreserving devotion and obedience to God, it shows forth and it shines through. And people are blessed because of how you and I believe and respond to the love of God and His call in our life. And this message this morning is entitled, Obeying the Commandments. Now, we're not talking about just uh, the Ten Commandments that are listed in the book of Exodus. We're talking about all the commandments that God has given. But in understanding this, it's coming from 1 John chapter 2, uh, verses 3 through 6. And, you know... Obedience is the central theme throughout Scripture. We were talking about in Sunday school between a mentoring relationship between Eli and Samuel, as we talked last week between uh, Moses and and Joshua. Uh, and it, the relationship that always seems to work out best is the relationship when it comes to that mentoring and spiritual relationship that always works out best are the ones that remain obedient to God in the process. And we also learn that when disobedience happens, the result, therefore, it always turns out to be devastating, whereas the obedience, the results, always turn out to be edifying and good. I think if you evaluate your life, and we evaluate our lives together, we could probably come up with 
the tragedies or the difficulties or the sadness or the moments of life that were not as healthy for us, it may go back to the times where our heart's focus was more on ourself and not God. And the times that we've succeeded and been happy and found ourselves in a good place are the times when our heart was right with God. And it goes back, you know this, you know it as simple as, simple as you can of what that central uh, theme of Scripture is, and it is obedience. The story of creation to the end of Revelation, it's difficult to turn a page that doesn't deal directly or indirectly with God's call of obedience. Remember, Jesus not only said, believe in me, he also said, follow me. He didn't say, just believe that I am Jesus the Messiah, but give me your life and be obedient to me and follow me for the rest of your life. We know that the scriptures are very clear that those who followed him, good things happened. Those who didn't, bad things happened. It all goes back to obedience. In our time, however, obeying God's command may, in our culture today, it doesn't take a far enough view or vision to see that that can be ignored, it can be dismissed, or even glossed over. Why? Because obedience slaps us back in the face. It confronts our sin. It challenges our lives. It runs contrary to the unwritten rule, who are you to tell me what to do? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's there. Yet God commands us to obey, not because he's on a power trip. That's not it. Rather, it's because he wants what's best for your life and mine. God's commands are not to kill our fun, it's to enhance our enjoyment. And yet disobey those commands and quickly we see how much sadness that we can experience in life. God's commands are not to box us in, it is his commands that gives us protection. Again, disobey those commands and quickly you and I understand and see how much trouble it creates when disobedience happens. So I want to discuss four realities for obeying commands that are revealed in Scripture. And those four things, I think, are really reminders. I'm not going to be giving you something that's profound that you've never heard of before. It's probably going to be an aha moment. Oh, yes, I understand. It's a reminder of what obedience, how obedience needs to be and how it plays out through our life. So four realities of obeying his commands. Number one is this. Obedience proves our salvation. Now let me, under, let me try to give explanation to this. John begins in, in chapter 2 here in verses 3 through 6, and let's give it the context now. This is how we, uh, in chapter 2, this is how we are sure that we have come to know him. How does he say it? This is how we know, we, we can be assured that we know him. The answer is by keeping his commands. The one who says, I have come to know him without keeping his commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word truly in him, the love of God is perfected. This is how we know we're in him. The one who says, he remains in him, should walk just as he walked. So obedience proves our salvation. We know that we have come, we, we know what we know because of what we do. John is saying that not only we know God, but that we know that we know God. And the way we understand that is moving beyond the head knowledge it becomes the heart knowledge that's fleshed out in everyday life. Sometimes our hearts doubt, and John's saying that we can know in our hearts. And one of those evidences or evidence or sign of knowing that we know God is that we obey his commands. And yet, let me be clear, John's not answering the question, how does one become a Christian? This is not what he's answering. That's not what he's saying. He's, he's saying that, 
that he's not saying that if you want to be saved or receive God's grace or know God, then you have to obey. He's saying, here's how you know that you know God. It's manifested throughout the DNA of who we are. It's manifested in our actions. It's manifested in our thoughts. It's manifested in our obedience. It's manifested in how we respond back to God. In other words, we know that we know God because we want to keep his commandments. That's the truth of it. John is not teaching that salvation is conditional upon obedience because it's not. John is teaching that salvation is the evidence of that obedience. And in turn, that obedience contributes to the assurance of our salvation. Obedience is a sign that we know God, recognizing that God expects his people to live in a certain way, and that way is his way. In the Old Testament, the prophet Hosea complained that the people of Israel did not know God. There's no faithfulness, Hosea says, no love, no acknowledgement of God in Hosea chapter 4, verse 1. How did he know this? He immediately confirmed by saying this. There, there is only cursing, lying, murder, and stealing, and adultery. What had the people done? Each of those actions had violated the Ten Commandments. And it was proof of the knowledge that the people who were trying to serve God were not loving God, did not know God because they didn't care about the Ten Commandments. They didn't have a passion for it. They didn't want to be obedient. So therefore, the evidence was they didn't know God. Because if they knew God, they knew what God required, and it was to obey those commands. So how do we know that we know God? The test is whether or not we keep His commandments. Do you obey God's Word? Is the Bible your final rule for your faith and your practice of your life? The answer to that question determines what you believe and what you've committed to and how your life is structured. You see, in addition to our Christian culture today, we have assigned the obligation of Christianity like make disciples, go into all the world to give tenth of our tithe, to serve, to do this, to do that, to a few while keeping the privilege of Christianity like experiencing God's comfort, receiving God's forgiveness, knowing God's guidance for us all. Still others think that keeping a few commandments is enough, but it's not. Partial obedience is another name for disobedience. A Nobel Prize nominated Christian Henry Schaefer, who is a famous chemist who teaches at the University of Georgia, tells the story of how he be began to reject Christianity. He had been raised in a nominally Christian home, and yet he attended a mainline Presbyterian church. And one day, in the midst of his discussion, in the kitchen, he made a point to his father about the ethical question by saying, Look, Dad, the Bible says such and such. The Bible says this. The Bible says that. And then the father responds back, I know what the Bible says, and it's wrong, son. Well, Henry Schaefer said at that moment he decided to be obedient to his father and adhere to the belief of his father, and he rejected Christianity as being false because his dad claimed to be a Christian, and yet rejected the teachings of the Bible, so he was following in the footsteps of his dad. Well, later on in life, through God's grace and mercy, Henry Schaeffer's heart was brought back to God, and he understood that saving faith in Christ that he had. And then he realized that it wasn't that Christianity was false, it was that his father's profession of faith was false. You see, if you believe the living God... You believe his word, you trust that word, you acknowledge that word is the final word in your life, and it rules your faith, and it, divide, it, it drives your practice of your life. You will do it until it hurts. <laughs> you will do it until the last breath is breathed, because you realize that sometimes obedience is hard, but it's necessary, because that's your passion. That's God's passion, that's God's love, and that's what he desires. So obedience proves that we are a people of salvation. For another reality of, this, of he obeying his commands is this is the exciting part because obedience transforms our lives. You see, by way of contrast in verse 4, John stated in verse 3 with a warning, the man who says, I know him but does not do the commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. 
Whereas at this point, if you claim to know God, but your life is not changed by knowing him, then it's a certain sign you don't know him. Because when you know him, you're transformed. And when you're transformed, you live for him. And by living for him, you love him. And by loving him, you have a passion for him. You want to see whatever's around your life change for the betterment and to the glory and the honor of God. He's saying that the person who does not keep God's commands does not have the truth at all. Why? Because the truth of God sets that person free from the life in which they're, they are, are enslaved to. It changes us. It transforms us. And once you have the truth, it fills you with a fire in the belly and a love for the living God comes out. It changes everything. God's truth leads to love. And it always leads to obedience. It always leads to a transformed life. So when that transformed life is not present, you can be certain that the person has never heard the truth. Because the truth has not impacted them. And if the truth of God impacts you, it changes you and sets you free. The reality is throughout Scripture, just said in so many different ways, because in Romans 5, Paul says, grace always reigns in righteousness. In Ephesians chapter 2, it says, salvation always leads to obedience. In Romans chapter 8, it says, justification is always accompanied by sanctification. In James 2, it says faith always shows itself in works. So in John chapter 2, verse, I mean, 1 John chapter 2, John is saying the same thing. Truth always expresses itself in transformation. So transformation is a product of obedience. Obedience is a product of transformation. The two go hand in hand. Obedience is a product of salvation. Salvation also leads to that obedience. The two go hand in hand. A third reality of obedience is that obedience springs from our love. John chapter 2 verse 5 of 1 John, 1, of 1 John it says this, But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. You see, in this verse, John broadens the scope. From obeying his commands to obeying his word. But it's the second half of the verse that grabs our attention because God's love is truly made complete in them. John's saying, he's saying that our love for God is a reflection of God's love for us. Our response to it so that our keeping of God's word could be a sign that God's love had done its full work in us. It has made us complete and that a believer's love is an entire love And it is a mature love. Here John addresses the motive. In essence, he's communicating that we know that we know God when we love to do what he commands. Three motives of obedience is this. We obey because we have to. We obey because we need to. Or we obey because we want to. And so the difference is... When you know the love of God, you want to obey Him. It's not that you have to obey Him. It's not that you need to obey Him. It's because you want to obey Him. You love Him because you realize His love is enormous and His love is for you. A slave obeys because he has to. If he doesn't obey, he's punished. An employee obeys because he needs to, because he's got to enjoy his work. He's got to make a living. He's got to provide for his family. But a believer obeys God's word because he wants to, for the relationship between him and God is one of love. And Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey what I command. And so understanding this reality is obedience springs from our love. I read of a housekeeper that went to work for a bachelor, and each day the man would leave this long list for his his housekeeper to do of the projects all throughout the house. And upon arriving at work, following, uh, you know, following all the things that he he see she does, he did a wonderful job. And then one day, relationships start to develop, and before long they begin to date, and before long they got married. And so no longer is she the housekeeper. She has become his wife. And so, newly wed, someone asked him, says, well, you know, when you you go home, does she still clean the house? 
does she still do all your lists that you leave her? He says, no. Sometimes she watches TV all day long, and she does nothing. No, no. You see, now the diff- it's different because she's not doing what I asked her to do because she has to. She now does what she wants to do because she loves me and she wants to do those things. It's because she loves me and I love her. We do it together. And so that's the true love for God is expressed in the moral obedience. We keep His commandments because our love for God is strong. And we know that His love for us is even stronger. And when we comprehend what Jesus did for us by sacrificing Himself upon a cross... Our response to love Him and obey Him is highlighted even more. Love delights to do God's will because it understands the cost and it understands the sacrifice of that love. Jesus loved to do God's will. And yet you and I, if we love Jesus, then we're going to love doing the will of the Father. If we're like Jesus, then we'll love to do that will. If we love God, we'll keep His commands, and that obedience will turn in evidence that our true love for God exists. So you see how it all plays together? It's not that we do the things we do because we have to. We do the things we do because we want to, because we fell in love with that which already loved us, and it is God. A fourth reality is that obedience characterizes our walk. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, John said, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Then John wrote, this is how we know that we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. So now it becomes a part of who we are. It's not only just our actions, but it is the reflection of everything we are. John employs another expression by being in him. In other words, the phrase is synonymous to live, which is the root word of abide, and yet it implies that a living relationship is a deep, close relationship through God, through Christ to God, and it is a relationship that is abiding in his presence. And so when you abide in God's presence, you realize how much joy it is to express God in everyday life. The relationship issues forth not a passive or indifference or inattention to duty, but in activity and commitment and love for God, imitating the very life that Christ is in our everyday life. In other words, if someone said to the Apostle John, I know Christ, John would say, good, I'm glad to hear it. And if you're abiding in Christ, then you're walking in Christ and you're living like Christ, right? How, did, how, did, how, does, how does he understand these things to be true? He, you and I live that obedience to the Father, not out of obligation, but out of passion, by, by, out of that which we want to do and we've come to love to do. You've heard the phrase, actions speak louder than words. That's exactly what John is saying. Your salvation speaks for itself. You know, if, if you are passionate about what you do, it's going to show. Actions speak loud and word. That's exactly what John wants us to grasp. Do, you, do our actions show that we're living in Christ? When I was a teenager, it circulated, and you've heard it many times before, if you're arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Great saints of old evidence their faith by their lives. Robert Chapman, a brother, brethren in Christ, set before himself this great aim. He said, seeing so many preach Christ and so few live Christ, my aim is to live for Christ. John Darby, a friend of his, said at the close of Robert Chapman's life, he lived what he believed and he lived what he taught. William Arnett was a great preacher of the past. A friend of his said his preaching was good, his writing was better, but his life was the best of all. Only one who spent a night in the presence of the great Murphy McShane could say this, Oh, that she is the most Jesus-like person I've ever seen. 
What will people say of you? This is going to sound morbid. But what did people say of you at your funeral? Yeah, I know it. What will they say of you when you're dead and gone? Will they say one thing I know about him or her is they live like Jesus? I can say that I love being in their presence because it was like being in the presence of Jesus. Can they really say that about you and I at the close of our life or the way we live that it affected the people around us? R.W. DeHaan wrote of a missionary shortly after arriving on the field was speaking for the first time to a group of villagers. He was trying to present the gospel to them. And he began by describing Jesus. He painted this beautiful picture of who Jesus was, referring to him as a man who was compassionate, who was kind, who was loving, who was caring, one who went about doing good works for all people, who loved people and wanted to see the best come out in every person. When he was speaking, he noticed that his lesson brought smiles to like as if he was presenting something very familiar to the villagers. The faces of the audience lit up, and some of them nodded their heads to one another in agreement and was chattering and whispering to one another. And yet, somewhat puzzled, he's getting distracted by all of their motion and commotion. He stops his sermon and says, Do you know what I'm talking about? And one of the villagers stood up and quickly responded, Yes, sir, we do. You're talking about a man who used to come here. Eagerly, they told about a missionary doctor who would come to their remote village and minister to all their physical needs. And his life was so like Christ and how he cared for them and how he loved them that the people said, We saw Jesus in him. He walked like Jesus walked. So we understand what you're saying. Are you living like Christ? Are you resting in Christ? If you found Him to be the source of every spiritual blessing of your life, you're trusting in Him through your salvation, you're fellowshipping Him through His grace, then your whole life has been changed and transformed, and yet you see everyone who is united with Christ expresses that union with Christ by living like Christ, walking as He walked. That's the obligation No, that's the desire. Yes, that's what we want to do. Yes, it's not what we have to do. It's what we want to do and we fell in love to do. It's our everyday process of our life. This message is important for two reasons. You realize the need of more grace in order to live the life because it is a saving grace that never stops saving. It keeps working in our life. This message is important because some wrestle with the lack of assurance because of all the imperfections that we live out in our everyday life. Keep to His commandments. Those commandments are what's there for our our enjoyment and for the betterment of our life. While keeping these commands is not the condition for salvation, it is the sign. It is the evidence of our salvation. It is the mark of the Christian life. Those four realities proves our salvation. Obedience transforms our lives. It springs forth our love, and it characterizes our walk. So would people know that you're a believer by the way you live? Would people know that you're a believer by the way you live? There's something different about him or her. Do you walk as Jesus walked? I was an eighth grader when I first met Renee. And we were, you know, those, hi, <laughs> you wave at each other and you pass by on the hallway. The next day, you kind of look for each other to speak again. And then, you know, I'm, I'm actually in seventh grade. She's in eighth grade. She leaves the middle school. I'm left there all by myself. And so for a whole year, I don't know her. And then when I get to high school, Guess who's one of the first people I see? The girl I used to timidly and shyly wave at in middle school. And the more I got to know her, the more I saw in her what I did not have. She was raised in a Christian home, always in church, 
always around a youth group, always around Christian friends, hung out with the you know, good reputation of people, and yet I was just the opposite. And I kept getting further and deeper into her life and her family's life through the dating process. Then I began to go to church. I began to ask questions. Why, why are you this way? And whatever you have, I want. How do I get it? And the more I went to church and the more I saw these things and I heard these words and I, and I listened to these sermons preached and heard the music sung and watched the people pray, the relationships of others, things began to dawn. And one day, sitting there in a revival meeting on a Thursday evening, the call was given. For those who want this for your life, as I listened to the testimony of that evangelist, said that if you want the satisfaction, you want this joy, you want Jesus, then give yourself up and come to this altar and proclaim Him as Lord and Savior of your life. And that began the process of knowing Jesus, of understanding Him. And yet, I can't say from the very moment I became a Christian, I was so excited that, that I want to do everything right. No, I had to learn. I had to go through that process of becoming and understanding what the next step is for my life. And the more I come to know who God is, the more I knew Him and knew His love for me. And the more I wanted to love Him back in every action of my life. Have I always done that? No. Have I failed? Yes. Have I misrepresented Him? Yes. But I hope that in closing my life, I can say I represented him more than my mistakes. I loved him more than I didn't. And I served him greater than I thought I hadn't. So would people know that you are a believer by the way you live? Do you walk as Jesus walked? These are not questions to say, to prove to you a failure. That's not the point of the questions. The questions are to say, hey, maybe I'm not, but today is going to mark the day that I will from here on out because I know Jesus, and I want him to know that I know him by the way I live and the way I conduct myself in the obedience that I do in my everyday life. What you say to someone makes a difference. What you do to someone can make a greater difference. How you respond in the words and how you respond in actions, because actions speak loud and words can have the greater impact. Love as Jesus loved, do as Jesus did, walk as Jesus did, obey God as Jesus did. And why did Jesus do it? Because he loved his Father. Why do we do it? Because we love Jesus and what he's given to us. Obedience matters, not because we have to, but because we want to. Father God, we thank you. That today you remind us of the importance of obedience that's right there in such a simple passage of a few words of Scripture of the importance of loving you and living for you. Lord, thank you for allowing us the privilege and the honor of serving your kingdom and serving in a vast God who loves this created world and desires for a people of faith to live for you greater and greater every day. Father, thank you for your forgiveness for when we have taken our eyes off of you and done our own thing. And your forgiveness is there to get us back in line as we repent from those things and, and call upon you to live greater and more passionately for you every day. Lord, I thank you that there's many people who are listening today and many people in this room who love you great, who love you in a great way. Who, who are a great representation of a kingdom that transforms life here on earth on into eternity, who are ambassadors of a greater cause than this culture thinks they have. And I thank you for the examples of those who've walked before all of us, who inspire us and encourage us to live life in a greater way for you. Thank you, Father, that you allow those shortcomings of our life to become strengths now to help us to remind us and help us to be reminded of not making those same mistakes twice. Lord, thank you for allowing us to be your children and for the joy of obedience that is gifted to us through the gift of salvation that you so freely give to all. 
And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. My friend, we want to stand and sing a song of invitation, trust and obey. And as we do that, may this be a song of affirmation, a song of invitation, as we trust all our cares unto him. So let's stand together. Let's sing. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey not a shadow can rise not a cloud in the sky but his smile quickly drives it away not a doubt or a fear, not a sigh or a tear, can abide while we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey.